From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And coming your way today from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Jim Robb, on this week's cattle market segment. Jim will talk about the LMIC's new projection on calf and yearling prices for the remainder of 2017. And he'll comment on the market significance of the tariff hike on U.S. beef exports into Japan. Then K-State's Cassie Jones and Ashton Yoder report on their new study of mycotoxins in harvested corn and how those toxins can be reduced substantially by screening corn as it goes into storage for on-farm livestock feeding. And later, Sarah Moyer will be joined by K-State's Elia Mestrovich C for this week's 4-H segment. All this and more next on Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. We're glad to have you along for this Agriculture Today as we take up the cattle market scene once again. And Jim Robb is joining us once more. As you know, Jim is the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center based in Denver. Jim, we'll uh, talk in a few moments about some numbers that the LMIC has put out forecasting calf and yearling prices for the balance of this calendar year. Before we do that, though, the fed cattle trade last week, as the week progressed, it tended to range fairly widely, you say. We had some real softness in the fed cattle prices early in the week. Eric, packers were very much standing back from the marketplace. We actually had USDA report some fed cattle trade at $112 per hundredweight, which was really kind of set people back a little bit. But by the end of the week, we traded cattle fully steady with the prior week, and we had some loads go out at 118 So. It was a pretty important week in terms of probably setting a tone here for the next couple of weeks. Packers continue to process lots of animals. We had slaughter up 8.7% from a year ago on total cattle. So they're, they continue to, to need and want a lot of cattle. If that trend continues, uh, that will help at least keep this floor established in the fed cattle markets. There seems to be no doubt that there is packer profitability out there. The margins are favorable. Packers margins are favorable, and I think uh, the retail featuring and some of the restaurant featuring continues to be rather aggressive, and at least so far, those export markets have still been rather strong. So those have all come together to uh, keep the Packers profitable and and keep them wanting animals, and we're, we're very current in our feed yards. One clear indicator of that is the dress steer weights for the latest report to week, and they were 12 pounds for dress steers below a year ago and 16 pounds below two years ago. So we would categorize this as the cattle feeders remaining current and probably not in a lot of pressure to uh, need to move animals. Now, the feeder cattle auctions have been doing pretty well throughout most of the summer, but this past week, additional strength in those trades as you look around Kansas and the trading points there. I think it was a rather good week for feeder cattle prices. I kind of stood back and looked across Kansas and Oklahoma, and Eric, I saw that those heavier weight yearlings actually had some week-over-week increases. Mm -hmm. What was reported on those lighter weight cattle, though, on the feeder cattle side, let's say five to 600-pound steers, were in many cases softer week-over-week. And so I think that strength in that heavyweight category is something to really consider. We have some pastures starting to dry out, at least in the northern parts of your state and surrounding states. And Those heavier weight animals, clearly looking at the marketing opportunities given the relative strength there, putting a sharp pencil to that may uh, pay off. Speaking of drought conditions, Jim, you tell us that you recently made a run to South Dakota on assignment and had a chance to make firsthand observations on the impact of the drought on crop production, but more directly for our purposes here on the cattle industry, on forage production. Your take on what's happening in North and South Dakota and parts of Nebraska as well with the extreme and intense drought and and how that's likely to play out as far as the cattle markets themselves. 
well, we're really on the cusp, Eric, of uh, this becoming a, a nationwide issue. The drought really covers central and eastern Montana, most all of North and South Dakota, and is drifting down into Nebraska, especially the northern sand hills, and even in eastern Wyoming. It's probably more droughty as I drove through the country than the drought monitor indicates. Using USDA's county by county estimates, they would put the total cattle herd, which includes feedlots and dairy animals, that 15% of all cattle in the United States are in that drought zone. Not all of those are in the most severe drought zone, but many of these areas are in their second year of drought, and your listeners in the Southern Plains will recognize that the second year of drought, very difficult management decisions need to be made. Mm -hmm. We've seen cow-calf pairs move out of those states in recent months, but really to the point now where there's a lot of early weaning going on. Saw quite a few more hay trucks moving north out of Wyoming, Colorado, and the irrigated parts of Nebraska into those drought areas that I've seen in many years. So we're starting to make some of those difficult decisions, especially the two-year areas of drought where cow herds are being culled down, uh, all open cows are moving to market, a lot of early weaning going on, and that's changing the dynamic. Anytime we talk about you know, 10, 15, 20 percent of the nation's cow herd in a severe drought zone, that starts to really make a difference. So we're keeping a close eye on that area. If we look at marketing patterns, there's a lot of lighter weight calves that will be coming to market Cull cow numbers will pick up. But then again, as we step back a couple more states, we have quite good pasture and range conditions. So it's it's going to be important to watch over the next several weeks. So you're saying that it's difficult to really, with any kind of accuracy, pin down the degree of disruption we're likely to see in cattle flow? Well, right now, you know, the biggest disruptions uh, and the magnitude are the areas in the second year of drought. And that's smaller than the total drought area. Now, as this persists, if it does persist, I think the impacts will get larger quickly. This is not country where we have a lot of carryover forage, and they're using that up rather quickly. This tends to be rangeland and rather low rainfall zone. So the recovery period, let's say compared to eastern Nebraska or eastern Oklahoma or Kansas, is is much slower in this zone. It's a rather low precipitation zone. So the number of cows that are now being sorted out for culling purposes probably does change some of our expectations in the second half of this year in terms of how big the U.S. cow herd will be on January 1, 2018. How much, as you mentioned, though, is really a story still in process. That uh, is a good transition into an article that you wrote up on the lmic.info website recently. Calf and yearling prices, the outlook, and a review of where we are at mid-year compared to last year. Although uh, we're similar, you say, in calf and yearling prices to a year ago, we have seen a bounce back from this past fall. I've seen a strong run-up since last October, November in calf and yearling prices. Clearly underpinning that has been the turnaround and the very strong profitability in the cattle feeding sector. And that has spelt back over, especially in the second quarter of this year, into calf and yearling prices. Uh, calf prices, for example, in the first quarter of this year, were down $30 per hundredweight in the Southern Plains year over year. But in the second quarter, we're only down $3.40. So you know, this dynamic in the marketplace, we still have some year-over-year declines in, in the market probably on average, but recent weeks we've had calf and yearling prices in almost every market of the U.S. except for some in the very northern plains above a year ago. So this is a market that looks quite a bit different than last year, again, underpinned by the Fed cattle side. And as we look ahead, maybe a little bit more optimistic than we were a year ago in terms of calf and yearling prices. And to what extent? Well, at, at this point, you know, the real roll down in calf and yearling prices that followed the fed cattle market last October and in the subsequent six weeks or so, we don't think we'll have to do that again this year, especially if the fed cattle market kind of keeps the underpinning that it's had recently. So a strong fed cattle market, we could easily have calf prices this fall, 8 to $12 per hundredweight in the Southern Plains above last fall. Now, last fall was very depressed, but you know, that's a year-over-year increase in these calf and yearling prices. Yearling prices probably stay somewhat above last year. Again, that's largely dependent on the fed cattle market. But these yearling prices on a year-over-year basis look to have strength in them also. You know, that's probably not something that we expected six months ago. And again, that really does reflect this broader dynamic in the marketplace that's been uh, supportive. 
Producers can have a look at that full write-up on this very topic at lmic.info, by the way. One more item we want to touch upon, Jim, in our time with you today, and that is what's going on with our beef business with Japan. And it's been well publicized now that Japan has announced that its tariff on imported beef from the U.S. is going to be ramped up from 38.5% to 50%, and that'll be in place through spring of next year. This has to do with the WTO agreement and uh, trigger mechanisms and so forth. But uh, just how damaging will this be to our beef business with Japan? Well, it's a dynamic industry, and you're certainly right that the U.S. tariffs on frozen beef, and there's two categories, fresh and frozen and, and or chilled and fresh and fro- versus frozen. This only applies to frozen. On average, over recent years, that's been about 50-50 in terms of tonnage. The frozen component tends to be a rather less expensive product, and so the U.S. is going to face these higher tariffs, but Australia and Mexico, for example, because they have trade agreements with Japan, get to keep their rates unchanged. Australia, for example, would be about 27 percent, well, we'll, we'll be 50 percent, and Mexico will be just over 30 percent. So, so, you know, some countries are going to benefit and the U.S. is going to lose a little bit. Now, a very large proportion of the frozen beef that goes to Japan are short ribs. Um, that's a product that doesn't carry a lot of value in the U.S. It's rather fatty. And we'll have to absorb probably a little bit more of this short rib product, and that will mostly be grounded in what we call 50s, that 50% fat, 50% lean product that is heavily used as a component of hamburgers, et cetera. So it's rather clear cut. It's a negative. How much, Eric, is still a bit up in the air? We'll, we'll monitor it, of course, because Japan is our leading target for U.S. beef exports by volume year by year. We appreciate the input, Jim, and we'll catch up with you again in the not-too-distant future. Many thanks to you. It's my pleasure, Eric. Providing these comments on the cattle markets and the trends, that's Jim Robb. He's the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center, a project co-sponsored by numerous land-grant universities, including K-State. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. We're back now on this agriculture today. We are very rapidly approaching corn harvest time in Kansas. We want to look at that harvest activity from the livestock feed quality angle now, for that's an aspect of research that's been taken up recently by two individuals here at K-State who are with us now over from the Animal Sciences and Industry Department. Cassie Jones is a livestock feed scientist at the university and a graduate researcher working with Cassie. Ashton Yoder is along with us as well as they talk of cleaning corn for quality and for preservation of animal health, quite frankly, Cassie. And what you're going after here are certain mycotoxins that can turn up in harvested corn, correct? That's right. And we thought that it was timely to visit with you about this this week because as we kick off harvest for the year, it's time to consider some of those activities that we can do to minimize the entry and the growth of mycotoxins in our corn crop and during storage throughout the year. Let's identify specifically what we're talking about when we refer to mycotoxins. One of the primary names that comes to mind, aflatoxin, but there is a complex of pathogens here, right? That's right. Mycotoxins are naturally occurring hazards that can cause illness in both animals and in people. And they're the substrate or or the product of molds. And so whenever you have moldy corn or moldy grains, that does not necessarily mean that there are mycotoxins in them, but they may be producing mycotoxins, which would be um, really a carcinogen. And so they're the most potent natural carcinogen known to man. So they're very harmful to both people and animals. And in fact, last year's corn harvest 
sparked some questions about this, which led you to pursue this research, you say, Cassie. That's right. Last year in central Oklahoma and certainly in, in central, uh, south central Kansas, we were dealing with quite a bit of aflatoxin and some famonisin corn, um, as well as famonisin and some of our other grains. And so we were being contacted by beef producers, cattle producers, uh, producers of, of pigs and poultry with questions about problems in, in mycotoxin issues in, in their corn crop and wondering what are safe levels to feed, as well as what could they do with some of this mycotoxin contaminated corn. Mm-hmm. And it was that latter point that you looked at here, and you found that there hasn't been really any specific research on cleaning corn for this purpose. That's right. It's a pretty standard industry practice, and and, and most people would, would know and understand that if you remove the broken kernels off of a load of corn, that we know that we reduce the mycotoxin content content by some degree. But we were dealing with such a high aflatoxin and famonisin level in some of these corn crops that we were really trying to get to the answer of how much mycotoxin would be removed. And that was something that we could not answer before we've done this research with Ashton. All right. And when we speak of cleaning a grain such as corn, there are several components to it, but the one that you are obviously focused on is sanitation. That's right. So when you clean grain, and, and the way that we're talking about it from this perspective, is removing Removing that broken corn by screening it, basically. So running it across one or two different screens to pull apart different fractions. So obviously any larger cob fractions that might be left, but certainly those broken corn kernels, because it would be the exposed endosperm in those corn kernels that would be most likely to grow additional mold. And so removing them will help reduce that mycotoxin content. So, Ashton, we turn to you to lend more particulars on how this study was conducted, uh, how you actually handled the corn, how it was screened, and so on. Go through that, if you would, for Mm -hmm. us. Yep. After we received the corn at the OH Cruz Feed Technology Innovation Center at Kansas State, we divided that corn into sections. Each uh, Each section had the same amount of weight, and then after they were put into sections, they were cleaned across two sets of screens, uh, whether that be a 3 16th inch screen to remove the, the screenings or a half-inch screen to remove the overs. After screening and separating those, that corn into fractions, uh, we were able to quantify the amount of both the aflatoxin and femonisin present inside those corn samples. Yeah, we didn't point this out earlier, but it was affirmed that this corn was in fact tainted with aflatoxin and fumonisin. Is that right? That is correct. And what did you arrive at in terms of removal of the particles that might contain those toxins? For the quantity, uh, we tested between the screenings and the, the overs, unclean corn and clean corn. Uh, screenings tested to be substantially higher than uh, any other fraction. Um, in our research, the unclean corn that we started with measured at, on average, about 1,000, 1,000 parts per billion aflatoxin. By cleaning it, we reduced that down to about 730 parts per billion aflatoxin. And while the screenings contained about 4,200 parts per billion aflatoxin, so substantially higher in the screenings fraction. So you were, in effect, removing a high percentage of the mycotoxins involved here then? Yes. Eric, the cleaned corn as a result of the cleaning process was about 26% lower in aflatoxin contamination and about 45% lower in famonisin contamination than the uncleaned corn. And that was pretty substantial, Mm -hmm. that we can get that large of a knockdown, either through the physical abrasion process or by just removing those broken kernels. But the alarming part that Ashton was was describing is that we really magnified the concentration of mycotoxins in the screenings portion. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's an important lesson to take away as we move into harvest and consider the role of pulling these screenings off is that we multiplied the aflatoxin content by four times. We multiplied the fumonisin content by seven and a half times when we moved from uncleaned corn into the screenings fraction. So you're basically forcing that mycotoxin into a small quantity of screenings that need to be handled with care and <laughs> obviously it can't be fed to livestock. What does one do with those is the question. At well, the that's, that's one of the problems because 
many times we do feed screenings to livestock, and it is a, a good and, and inexpensive feed stuff. My caution to producers, particularly if they're cons- if they think that their incoming grain crop is higher in mycotoxins, is to really do some cost benefit analysis. In this experiment specifically, we saw six percent shrink. We moved six percent of the weight of the uncleaned corn in screenings, and many grain elevators and producers would not want to just simply throw away six percent of the screenings. But in this case, when we're dealing with a screenings fraction that has 4,000 parts per billion of aflatoxin and 300 is the most that you can feed a beef cow. Mm-hmm. You that's can't a, really dilute that. <laughs> you can't dilute it. And in fact, it's illegal too from the FDA. And so some of the best things to do is really just put those in compost or send them to the trash. But the actual corn you screened and, and cleaned, it is good to go. It's in the safe zone then, by and large, for feeding or not? Well, the process made it safer. To start with, we had such a high aflatoxin level. This was one thousand ppb corn. And again, most of the time we're seeing anywhere between 100 and 200 ppb. So that considered, even if we were at a thousand, we did lower it down to the 700 range. And when you consider that into a livestock or a diet formula, that's about 50 percent corn. Yeah, we were able to make this a safe product to feed to animals. Might ask you, would further and more intense screenings add to the improvement at all, do you think? It may not have been part of your actual research experiment here, but Ashton, any thoughts? I think it has value. I've done some, had some thoughts on this, and I think it would be valuable to see how a uh, how cornmeal is clean because they have a more intense process by they possibly remove the outer coat even of the kernel and actually get rid of all the, the overs and anything outside of being a kernel completely. So maybe that's something to pursue as the next step in this research then. One thing that Ashton did find, however, though, was that it didn't matter how many times he ran it across the same screen, that if he ran it across once versus twice, just by the physical abrasion, that the number of times across the screen did not increase the percent of contamination that we could remove. Even if a producer out there is inclined to take this on and screen their corn for this purpose. That does not preclude, Cassie, the need for testing one's corn if there's any doubt at all about its uh, toxin content. Certainly. And if there's any takeaway as farmers are starting to tune up their combines, that's something that I want them to remember. As we go into storage or into feeding with new crop corn, remember that it's logical and it's, it's smart to test that corn and those grains from mycotoxins so that you have a better understanding of what those risks are and you can manage those those risks once they're quantified. But the point here is one can make a difference through this screening process if one is so inclined to take it on. Absolutely. Well, it's good work on the part of both of you and uh, an interesting question that is obviously very timely with corn harvest knocking on the door here, making sure that there is no high level of mycotoxins existing in that corn as it's stored away for future feeding to livestock. And we thank the both of you for sharing the story right here, Cassie Thanks, Eric. and Ashton. Thank you. Over from the Animal Sciences and Industry Department here at Gay State, researchers Cassie Jones, she's on the faculty as a livestock feed specialist, and Ashton Yoder, who is a graduate researcher working with Cassie. And once more, this new study quantified the extent to which one can remove those highly harmful mycotoxins from corn through the screening process before that corn ever makes it to the feed bunk or self-feeder. You are tuned in to Agriculture Today. Now we'll stand aside for these next few moments. When we come back, today's agricultural news headlines will come your way. Also awaiting with this week's edition of Tree Tales is K-State Forester Bob Atchison. And later, Sarah Moyer checks in with K-State's Alaya Mestrovich C. As they'll offer up this week's Kansas 4-H segment for us. So keep it right here, won't you, on this, the K-State Radio Network. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
you're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and for you now, today's agricultural news headlines, these courtesy in part of DTN. Well, U.S. beef exports to Japan have been very successful so far in 2017, especially in the higher-value chilled category. However, even with chilled U.S. exports expanding at such a rapid pace through May, chilled volume was up 45 percent from a year ago, valued at $414 million. The Japanese market still has a strong need for frozen imported beef. The first quarter of Japan's fiscal year, April through June, saw substantial year-over-year growth in its frozen beef imports, triggering Japan's frozen beef safeguard. This happens when imports exceed the year-ago level by more than 17 percent. And this by the slimmest of margins this time, just 113 million tons, the threshold was crossed. Now, as we referred to as we visited with Jim Robb earlier in the broadcast, Japan's already lofty 38.5% duty on imports of frozen beef carcasses increases to 50% for the remaining eight months of the fiscal year through March the 31st. The higher rate applies only to imports from countries that don't have a trade agreement with Japan. Among the major suppliers, that includes the U.S., Canada, and New Zealand. Australian beef will not be affected by the triggering of the safeguard due to the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement. One of the frustrations with Japan's beef safeguards is that the Japanese beef industry has gone through fundamental changes since the mid-1990s and is no longer nearly as vulnerable to lower-priced imports as it was at the time that the safeguard provision was negotiated. The safeguards are not needed to bolster Japan's cattle producers, so they essentially just add costs to imported beef and place U.S. beef at an even greater disadvantage compared with the Australian product. Now, some Japanese Japanese buyers can and will likely shift to chilled beef, but chilled beef does not work for every customer due to the higher product and shipping costs, which could offset the lower duty. And if the higher frozen duty rate causes a shift toward chilled imports, this increases the possibility that the chilled beef safeguard could be triggered later on in the fiscal year. The USDA now has complete trade numbers for the first nine months of the fiscal year. What do those numbers show for U.S. agricultural exports? Here's a summary from the USDA's Gary Crawford. The ag trade numbers are just now out for June. June ag exports coming in at $10.4 billion, so that makes three straight months of month-to-month declines in agricultural export sales. Back in March, the U.S. sold $12.4 billion worth. April, it dropped to 10.8. May, 10.6. June, 10.4. But USDA's Outlook Board Chairman Seth Meyer says this has been a fairly regular thing recently. As the fiscal year winds down, so do our exports. This has become increasingly so when you look at it over the last couple decades. As our exports have grown, they've grown in the first six months of the year. It's the second six months where they usually don't. That's when South American crops come into the market. Also, we are still running ahead of last year at this time by over $12.5 billion. USDA's current fiscal 2017 export forecast calls for $137 billion. So we've got three months to sell $27.7 billion worth. That would get us up to that 137 mark. USDA will issue a new export forecast, though, August 29th. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. Also in the headlines today, the Environmental Protection Agency has yet to decide whether to grant a request by a number of Democrat senators to extend by 90 days the public comment period on the proposed rollback of the Waters of the United States or WOTUS rule, that according to an agency spokesperson speaking to DTN on Friday. In a letter dated July the 17th, the EP2 EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt and Douglas Lamont, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army Corps of Engineers, a group of 22 senators asked the agencies to extend the comment period. As of Friday, the EPA had received more than 11,000 public comments ahead of the August 28th deadline on the proposal to reset the clean water rule back to pre-2015 language prior to the final WOTUS rule. Of those comments, just 330 have been posted to date. The agency announced it would attempt to better define navigable waters in what's expected to be a two-part effort. The current proposal would revert the rule back to pre-2015 before the EPA finalized the WOTUS rule. And the second part of the agency's plan includes the rewriting of the rule. As part of that effort, the agency already has reached out to governors in all 50 states to seek their input. 
You're listening to Agriculture Today. Remember, the K-State Kansas Livestock Association Ranch Management Field Days are coming up starting next week at the Black Diamond Angus Ranch near Spearville on the 17th, Mark Dieterich Family Farms near Greenleaf August the 22nd, and D.L. Cattle Company near Fredonia on August the 23rd. Details are coming together on those programs, and you can keep up on those details and find out more at kla.org. Now, this week's edition of Tree Tales with K-State Forester Bob Atchison. Bob? The decline of the Ogallala Aquifer is one of Kansas' greatest natural resource challenges. At stake is the loss of significant agricultural contributions to our economy. Loss of stream flow and water tables have opened the door for invasive species like tamarisk and Russian olive, which thrive in the saline soils associated with the Arkansas River. One estimate suggests that tamarisk infests 56% of the Arkansas River Corridor in Kansas, about 55,000 acres. These invasives displace native grasses and forbs, degrading wildlife habitat for endangered species like the hooping crane and the least tern. In response to these issues, the Kansas Forest Service at Kansas State University has been awarded a $300,000 grant from the United States Forest Service to remove tamarisk and Russian olive on 3,000 acres of the Ark River and establish native grass, willow, and cottonwood communities. The Kansas Forest Service is working with a host of partners to get the project on the ground, including the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, which will reimburse landowners' costs to remove the invasives and restore native plant communities. The three-year project begins this summer with the goal of completing the work by 2019. Other project deliverables include assessing and classifying areas of the river based on groundwater decline and identifying areas where restoration can be sustained. The Kansas Forest Service will work closely with the Kansas Department of Agriculture to develop a statewide comprehensive strategy for the control of tamarisk and Russian olive. Additional information about the project may be obtained by contacting the Kansas Forest Service at 785-532-3300. Check us out on the web at www.kansasforest.org. This is Bob Atchison with the Kansas Forest Service encouraging you to care for and protect the woodlands and shelter belts of our state. You've been listening to another Tree Tale. Thanks, Bob. And this is Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Sarah Moyer here with our weekly 4-H update from this time one 4-H extension specialist, Aliyah Mestrovich C. Good to have you on, Aliyah. Thank you for having me. And today our focus is on some creative aspirations of young 4-Hers and specifically those who are celebrating their culture through poetry. Will you explain the program that's in place Absolutely. So a couple of years ago, Minadora Mascherette was a graduate assistant at the Department of 4-H Youth Development at K-State, and she is a poet. So she created a poetry project called I Am Kansas, or Soy Kansas, which is I Am Kansas in Spanish. She and I and some other folks here in Manhattan worked with Riley County 4-H Verde Clovers. So that poetry project then extended to some reservations in Kansas recently and asked them to talk about their cultural identity. Youth that are from underrepresented communities that focus on their cultural identity and are proud of who they are, actually that is a factor in resiliency. Having them talk to us about all the different parts of their identity, we've come up with some really special works of art. And you have a couple of those to share with us today, correct? I do, yes. The first poem is called Where I Am From, and this is by Guadalupe Rodriguez. She was seven years old when she wrote this poem. 
I am from Mexico, from Candy and Conchas. I am from the Yellow House in Dempsey Road. I am from Kansas, Bright River Sand, from Posadas and Novellas. I am from To Be Quiet and Don't Jump on the Bed, from Clean My Room and Do What I'm Told. I'm from To Be Quiet. So what we see here in this poem is many different parts of Guadalupe, or we call her Lupita, her cultural identity. She's written some in Spanish, so she actually wrote the words conchas, posadas, and novelas. Conchas is a type of wheat bread, and posadas is a traditional religious holiday that is normally celebrated in Mexico and in Spain in December that lasts nine days. Novelas, something that's watched on TV like a soap opera, so she wrote about that. She also wrote about some of the things that her mom tells her you know, being quiet, don't jump on the bed, do what I'm told. And so that was part of her poetry as well, along with her ethnic identity, identifying as being Mexican, but also identifying as being Kansan. And a lot of times, youth that are from two different languages and cultures are often feel the pressure to choose one and not embrace both of them. And that creates a lot of stress in that youth, and that can lead to delinquency and other things. So what we wanted to do is encourage the kids to embrace both of their cultural identities in the poem, and that comes out in her poetry, I am from Mexico, I am from Kansas, and embracing the fact that she can be both in the same moment. It's very profound to me that a seven-year-old would be able to write something like this, and that just showcases cultural identities of many of our youth in Kansas that sometimes we don't realize until we ask. I would like to read one other poem, and it's called Where I Am From, from a little boy who's 11 years old, and his name is Bryson McGrew, and he is from the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. We actually had youth from the Iowa tribe and the Kickapoo tribe that go to the Boys and Girls Club. We collaborated with the Boys and Girls Club on both reservations. This is one of the poems that came out of that collaboration. I am from Solar System, from Hot Wheels and video games. I am from the Country House, Quiet Fresh, PS3. I am from Blue, Mom, Sister, and Me. I'm from Meetings and Thunder Clan, from Amber and Billy. I am from The Mentor, from Be Responsible and Smart. I am from I Believe in the Creator. I'm from Deer Meat and Fish. I'm from the Horton Hospital and traveling from somewhere close to the Great Lakes to Kansas from the great uncle named Pammy Duke. So there was a lot going on in this poem, Sarah. Not only did he talk about being a modern Native American, he also talked about being part of the universe, talked about his belief system. He also talked about how important it is to have a mentor. I also wanted to unpack I am from Blue, Mom, Sister, and Me, and Bryson told me that in the Thunder Clan, within his tribe, the firstborn, they are given a certain color, and that color is blue, and the secondborn is then given the color red, the thirdborn is given the color blue, and it vacillates back and forth in that way, and that was his explanation to me. Well, he identified with his mom and his sister because they were also born under the color blue. He also talked about basically migrating, and you can also hear elders, his great uncle, that he identifies as being from his great uncle as well. So it's really been an honor to be able to share this poetry with you. It's so rich and special that they've shared with us, and I really wanted to honor that and be able to share it with as many people as I could. So certainly an exciting program for youth in Kansas, and especially those that don't always have the recognition or the celebration that other Kansans do. So a fun project there. And thank you again, Aliyah, for coming on and sharing with us. Thank you so much. That once again was 4-H Extension Specialist Aliyah Mestrovich C. sharing about the poetry project that's been going on with several groups of youth in Kansas related with the 4-H program, and if you'd like to access the published works, visit the K-State Bookstore at bookstore.ksre.k-state.edu. And that book title again is Where I Am From, so you can search that online at the K-State Bookstore. 
With that, it's now time for our county fair listing. There are a few that are still ongoing from last week. The Dickinson County Fair in Abilene, the Kelly County Fair in Winfield, the Harvey County Free Fair in Newton, the Lynn County Fair in Mountain City, and the Lyon County Fair in Emporia. Two county fairs kick off today, the Atchison County Fair in Effingham and the Morton County Fair in Elkhart. On Wednesday, the Harper County Fair, the Osage County Fair in Overbrook, and the Saline County Fair or Tri-Rivers Fair in Salina begin. The Interstate Fair and Rodeo in Coffeyville will begin this coming Saturday. And finally, the Rooks County Free Fair in Stockton begins next Sunday. Those are your county fair listings in Kansas. Be sure to check out what young people are doing in your community. This has been your 4-H segment for the week. And that is all the time we have for today. For Eric Atkinson, I'm Sarah Moyer, and you've been listening to Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.